So I actually thought in my initial planning this would be the first talk, my first talk of the day, but it ended up being the second one, which is great. But going back to history, I was planning to present at the start of my um, talk about biopharmacolo biopharmacological prevention some extracts of this book, which is one of the very first book or booklets uh, from the community. So Joseph Sonaben was uh, one of the first openly gay doctors in New York looking after people with HIV in a time where they didn't even know it was HIV, it was AIDS. And um, Richard Berkowitz was a male sexual he sex worker in New York City who was one of the first ones to use condoms with clients as soon as the idea that it could be possibly a sexually transmissible disease uh, arose. And Michael Cullen was just an activist from the community, a gay singer and composer and performer. And they got together and wrote this booklet about how to prevent, how to have sex in an epidemic, how to prevent AIDS from spreading in the, the gay community in New York. And they got spectacularly wrong the cause of AIDS because Joseph Sonaben was convinced it was CMV, cytomegalovirus, and repeated infections with different strains of cytomegalovirus causing immune activation and eventually immune depletion. So of course that was not the case, it was a new virus, not an old virus. But they got right so many other things that even now reading this booklet, I downloaded, I downloaded it from the internet so you can find the PDF by googling it. There are things that still resonate so much with our current debate. So the concept of sexual responsibility, no one likes to talk about individual responsibility and sex. It's all about I own my sexual health, you know, my ass, my rules, and basically I want to do what I want to do, and you guys keep me safe. But they were talking about sexual responsibility and how looking after your own sexual health, you are going to look after the sexual health of your partner <coughs> and of the wider community. And this is really a concept that resonates among some PrEP users as well, and that as a community, we really need to continue embracing. Um, so when you are deciding what sexual acts will take place, you must not only ask, will this pose a health risk to me, but also, will this pose a health risk to my partner? Staying in control, they become a bit too di didactic here probably and, you know. But things like this one, you know. Have we modified the belief that we could dance our way to liberation into the belief that we could somehow fuck our way there? And if sex is liberating, is more sex necessarily more liberating? And, you know, maybe affection is our best protection. Men loving men was the basis of gay male liberation, but we have now created cultural and I would say commercial institutions like sex on site venues and apps in which love or even affection can be totally avoided. It's just about sticking something in a hole, you know, in some cases. Um, Hard questions for hard times, but whatever happened to our great gay imagination? And, you know, not all gay men are well educated and well off. Barriers to access. Now, we are still debating about that today. Uh, what the community must do is to make available vital information about how diseases are transmitted so that each of us can make informed decisions about our lives. And they conclude saying, what's over isn't sex just sex without responsibility. Like, this is amazing. And it was, even before, it was understood that HIV was actually the cause of AIDS. Anyway, back to today, you can still die of undiagnosed HIV in New Zealand, unfortunately. So I don't know if you're all familiar with Tonya history, positive women got in touch with the family and they were happy to use Tonya K's as a, as a you know, way to reach out and invite people to think about HIV and test about HIV, even people not belonging to the classical risk categories. So Tonya died of pneumocystis in Oakland City Hospital ICU in 2014, not in 1981. Um, 
She saw a number of healthcare professionals for unexplained health problems for two years. And then eventually a respiratory physician thought she was anxious and sent her to a physiotherapist to be taught how to breathe again because she was too anxious to breathe properly. And the reality was she couldn't breathe because her lungs were full of pneumocystis. So it was the chest physio who said, you're sick, you need to go to the hospital and sent her to the hospital in an ambulance. And four days after admission, oops, she was finally tested for HIV and she did not belong to a risk group and she died. Okay, and we heard yesterday at the HIV forum um, that another woman was diagnosed late and died of AIDS recently. So think about HIV, think about testing, even people who don't belong to the classical risk categories. Because diagnosis someone, diagnosing someone with HIV will speed up access to antiretrovirals and achieving the undetectable status. So as you can see from this data from Melbourne Sexual Health Clinics in 2007-2009, the time from infection to suppression was 49 months. Now not only this is bad for you, for your own health, but of course this is also bad from a public health perspective because if you're around 49 months from infection to viral suppression, you can infect a number of other people in the meantime. Whereas in 2015, 2016, that came down to 9.6 months, which is still too much and should really be no more than three months if all high-risk people are tested every three months, started on antiretrovirals immediately afterwards and achieve promptly viral suppression. That should be even less than that. But this is an impressive improvement and benefit, and we really need to work toward, towards that. Um, so condom and rising STIs, um, most of that has been already said by, by Peter. So the condom fatigue, the trivialization of HIV, you know, we also, friends and, and, and and brothers and sisters, gay and, and, and other risk population dying of AIDS in our days. The young gay people haven't. So, you know, they have never seen someone sick from HIV or in hospital or dying. So HIV is just one of those things that you can catch with sex, but then you take a tablet and you're all right. That's the trivialization of HIV. Um, internet dating and geolocalizing apps which make sex here and now urgent even, not just possible, but urgent because otherwise you miss out and someone else will, will pick up that hot guy you're looking the profile of on Grindr. And if you don't have a condom, well, too bad, you know, the, the urgency of sex takes priority. The new STIs, the antibiotic resistant STIs, porn, that's another big issue. Um, most young people learn about sex watching porn on their cell phones, you know. Um, and unfortunately, mo I would say most, but m much of the internet porn doesn't involve condoms. So the bareback porn has again normalized and trivialized condomless sex and that that's reflecting on how people approach for the first time um, sex without a condom because that's how it is on, on the internet. And then came sex. So the sex under the influence of drugs, particularly methamphetamine, but not only. And there are some challenges with condom use um, that Peter has partly mentioned negotiating condom use can be difficult where there is a power imbalance. So any of these couples will be, you know, with a power imbalance, female versus male, bottom versus top, younger versus older, poor versus rich, selling sex versus buying sex, ethnic minority versus white. Negotiating condom use in any of those situations can be particularly difficult. And the advantage of the biopharmacological methods like PrEP is that you don't need to negotiate condom use. You can just take your pill in the morning and then if sex happens at night and you can't negotiate condom use, at least you're safe from HIV. 
wouldn't, that's the same study um, Peter talked about, which gave the figure of 91% protection with condoms. Um, so treatment as prevention. So basically that's the benefit from being treated with antiretrovirals in terms of not transmitting HIV to someone else. So being on antiretrovirals entails two kinds of benefits. One is for own health, but also there's a public health benefit in terms of not transmitting HIV anymore. Um, you can also see it as U equals U, undetectable equals uninfectious, or test and treat, you know, all sorts of different definitions. And reports from multiple places in the world has sh have shown that it does work at a community level. So as the community viral load goes down, the number of new infections in the community goes down as well. Um, so we definitely need scaling up testing in New Zealand. We still have 600 MSM around living with HIV undiagnosed. That's the best estimate. So we definitely need to diagnose, put on treatment and get those guys to be undetectable. It's nothing new. Um, we did it a long time ago for vertical transmission so that we know that if pregnant women are on antiretrovirals, the risk of passing infection to the baby goes down dramatically. And this was just the, the seminal study with zidovudine monotherapy. These days with um, combination antiretrovirals, the risk goes down to essentially almost zero. Okay. So quite a few studies were done about treatment as prevention and undetectable equals uninfectious. The first one was the HTPTN052, which randomized couples with one partner HIV positive, one partner HIV negative, relatively high CD4 count at a time where it was still unclear exactly what was the optimal time to start antiretrovirals. We now know it's as soon as possible, but there was still some uncer uncertainty at the time. So they randomized the positive partner either to start antiretrovirals immediately or to wait until the CD4 count was 250 or less or developing AIDS. Now, one could argue that if you wait that much, your viral load goes up. So you become more likely to transmit HIV. So there is already a selection there, a selection bias, possibly and a randomization bias. Anyway, there were transmissions in HPTN 052, but there were no transmissions where the HIV was the same. So some guys and girls got HIV from someone else, not from, from their HIV positive partner. And when the partner was suppressed on antiretroviral therapy, there were no transmissions. There were a few transmissions immediately after antiretroviral therapy was started, so the viral load was still not undetectable, or because the virus was resistant and there was a rebound <coughs> in the viral load despite being on treatment. The partner study, for the first time, had a good number of MSM couples, so they could do separate analysis for MSM couples. Again, no linked transmissions, but we became familiar here and we tried to explain to the community as well the concept of confidence intervals, which is not so obvious to grasp if you don't have a basic understanding of statistics and epidemiology. So, as you all know, the confidence interval means the observed number of events is zero, but statistically, can we say this equates to a zero risk? Of course we can't, statistically, because all the studies are done on a sample, and unless the sample has an infinite size, there will always be a positive confidence interval. Okay, so I think someone estimated you'll have to run 20 studies of this size to get the confidence interval not really zero, but very, very close to zero. And particularly when you start doing subgroup analysis, 
So if you only consider the MSM couples where the negative partner was a bottom and the top partner ejaculated inside of him, well, your number of couples and of couple year follow-up goes down, which means your sample size goes down, which means your confidence interval goes up, okay? That's why you will never hear me saying the risk is zero. You will never ever hear me saying something like that. You'll hear me saying things like the risk is effectively zero, is almost zero, is negligible, but I will never say the risk is zero because it's not, statistically speaking. Um, the partner two was released very recently. So the abstract was presented in Amsterdam a few weeks ago. And basically they had more MSM couples so again, they could do an analysis with a larger sample size. And it's been put out like 77,000 condomless acts and there was no transmission. Well, when you look into the details, 7,000 were actually oral sex when we know very well that the risk is zero anyway. Okay. So again, if you consider only receptive anal sex when the negative partner was the bottom, and the top partner ejaculated inside of him, actually the, the acts were 20,000, not 77,000. The number of, of observed events is still zero, but of course the couple year follow-up goes down and the confidence interval, this enemy of ours now, goes up. So that means we still cannot say it's statistically zero. Okay. And the other study that was published online in July was the opposites attract, which was a study enrolling only MSM couples in Australia, Brazil, and Thailand. Again, there were 16,800 condomless anal intercourse acts, and they had three <coughs> infections, but they were all from a different partner, so they were not linked to the positive partner in the couple. And again, we have a positive confidence interval of 1.59. So again, a very low, effectively zero, negligible risk, but you will never hear me say it's a zero risk. Also, what do these studies all have in common? They're all studies do, done on stable, serodiscordant couples. Do they apply to the world of casual? partners in casual sex, app, internet dating, sex on site venue driven? You can argue no, they don't. Because in a stable couple, you are reasonably sure of what your positive partner is doing. You're reasonably sure they take their medications. You go with them maybe at the visits with their physician. You know their viral load results. In the casual sex arena, you rely on what your casual partner tells you. I'm positive, undetectable. Good, good on you. But still, I would like to use a condom because it's the first time we meet. The, having sex is the gay equivalent of shaking hands sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, I want to know you a bit more before I can actually trust you're really positive, undetectable. Okay. Sorry, Mozo, I can just ask the flip, the flip side of that, if you are uh, HIV positive, got it undetectable, you know you're taking events every day, you can be pretty damn certain you're not going to transfer to somebody else. Yes, so yeah. the, the official statement I like most, it's the one um, by Anthony Fauci, who said the risk is effectively zero for HIV positive people taking their medicines as prescribed who have reached undetectable status and maintained undetectable status for at least six months. So that's the formal U equals U statement shared by basically everyone in the sector who, you know, is competent, I would say, knowledgeable and sure about what they're saying and doing. U equals U doesn't apply to IV drug use. So if you share needles, there have been no studies to show that if you're undetectable, you don't transmit. It doesn't apply to breastfeeding. I know positive women are agitating for 
saying that an undetectable woman can safely breastfeed. That's still not the official advice. Okay, so U equals U has limitations. Um, but for sure, going a bit out of the MSM field into the general population heterosexual couples field, U equals U has introduced another option for family planning for the serodiscordant heterosexual couples because, you know, basically what I tell to my heterosexual discordant couples now is you can have safely sex and conceive without having to go through the ordeal of assisted reproduction provided your partner fulfills all the requirement of U equals U and provided you limit the condomless sex to the time required for conception. And then of course if you decide to continue with condomless legs, sex, that's fine, but if the objective is to conceive, you can limit the time of condomless sex just as long as it's enough to conceive safely. Um, Post-exposure prophylaxis, again, not a new concept. You know, we started giving zidovudine to healthcare professionals after a needle stick injury in 1987, and we, sh we were able to show 80% relative risk reduction if you had a healthcare professional, had a needle stick injury with an HIV positive source, took post-exposure prophylaxis, your risk of catching HIV was down by 80%. After sexual exposure, the data mm, are a bit less convincing, but there is still some role for post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, the ESHM guidelines say most people really should take a two-drug regimen, Truvada, as for PrEP, and they restrict the three drug regimens only if the source is known to be HIV positive and is not undetectable. And they say if the source is HIV positive and undetectable, the risk is so low that you don't even need post-exposure prophylaxis. Okay. Now, in New Zealand, we are restricted. Oh, sorry, that was the study on healthcare workers that I put up only because it was a multinational study, including Italy, and I participated in the Italian uh, branch of the study. We still had paper case forms at the time, so I remember filling those endless paper forms with all the details of the source and the exposed uh, healthcare worker and so on. Um, so the Pharmac Special Authority criteria for PEP are one month, only for condomless receptive anal intercourse when the exposure source is known to be HIV positive or for non-consensual sex and the clinician considers the risk assessment indicates prophylaxis is required. Now, I'm sorry that Bronwyn is not here anymore, but we are really hoping that Pharmac will, because now the PEP criteria are obviously out of sync with the PrEP criteria, so with exactly the same behavior, you qualify for PrEP, but you don't qualify for, for PEP. Having said that, as most people will need PEP with two drugs, you can just apply for PrEP and use the first month as a PEP, if it makes sense. Or if someone was under the influence of drugs and alcohol, you can say it was not consensual sex, so you apply for PEP. Um, Maybe Bronwyn doesn't need to know that. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, obviously these criteria were thought, having in mind a stable serodiscordant couple in the day when the positive partner was not undetectable, that were normally using a condom, and there was a condom accident, like a breakage or something. So you knew your partner was positive, and you had post-exposure prophylaxis. The previous medical director used to, when, when, when I confessed to doing uh, uh, things against the rules, would say that you, uh, as, a, as a clinician, you have to take into account the best needs of your patients. So, mm. Uh, mm. Um, um, the problem with that is in the area of dating apps, as I told you before, people don't know the names anymore, don't know the phone numbers. All they've got is a nickname on Grindr and maybe the day after the profile is deleted, so they don't have the nickname anymore. So how can you actually do the contact tracing and make sure 
the source was HIV positive or HIV negative, it's essentially impossible. Okay. Um, we've got people from Queenstown here, I believe, from the list of participants. I got the most hilarious email on Monday by Brendan, ID physician in Dunedin, saying, moaning about the huge numbers of people asking for post-exposure prophylaxis after the gay ski week. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that Southern DHB, for some reason, has decided to centralize all the antiretrovirals in the Dunedin Hospital Pharmacy, so they had to courier Truvada from Dunedin to Queenstown. <laughs> so I replied saying, can you tell me exactly how many for my own curiosity? And it was three. <laughs> and then I replied, well, I think Queenstown needs something to be in place all year round, not just for the gay ski week. Just think about all the, gay, uh, the backpackers and people on working holiday visas and huge numbers of young people in Queenstown at any given moment in time, you know, you really need them. Glad that there are some GPs and other people here from Queenstown. So I advise Brendan to get in touch with Edward Coughlin in Christchurch and to figure out, you know, a gay friendly GP practice in Queenstown who will be very happy to stock, and a friendly pharmacy, which will be very happy to stock some Truvada, and you guys liaising with Edward and Brandon in Dunedin to get the approvals and get sorted the, the guys in Queenstown without dramas. <laughs> so, of course, if you can give a medication to someone after exposure, then the natural thought is, well, can we give that pr before the exposure so people are protected. So that's how people had the idea of PrEP. And to be maximally effective for MSM, PrEP needs to be started seven days before exposure, continue daily throughout the exposure, and then for 28 days after the last possible exposure, even if people now are trying to shorten those, those times. But anyway, this is still the best way to take PrEP if you want to be 100% sure. Gay men are in an advantageous position regarding PrEP because the rectal tissue gets higher concentrations of tenofovir sooner than any other, other, any other tissue in the body. So basically, penile, cervicovaginal, and blood levels of tenofovir and tricytamine are slower to achieve than the rectal levels, which means if you're using PrEP in a female patient, they need to start sooner, probably 10 days or even two weeks before exposure. Okay. Um, and then we have a single study, the French study, Hypergay, that has showed efficacy for the frequent use of event-driven PrEP taken around the unprotected sexual intercourse. And that was among MSM only. But I'll go through the historical studies of PrEP so you can guess, again, some of the biases and some of the problems with the studies. And this is basically continuous PrEP, so you just take it all the time. This is the French hypergay style PrEP, so you only take it around sex, and sometimes you might be wrong, so think <laughs> sex will happen, but it doesn't, so you've wasted a few tablets. And then you can have periodic PrEP, so you're going on a gay cruise, you start your PrEP a week before the cruise, take it, and then take it for 28 days after the cruise, or you're going, you grow up in Opotiki, you, then you go to Wellington for uni, you know there will be a few years very busy with sex, so you decide to go on PrEP for those three years, okay? I personally don't believe PrEP will be the solution for the whole sexually active life of gay men, so I always tell my patients we now know that PrEP is safe for up to a few years. Time will tell if it's safe for longer. I personally don't believe you can start PrEP at age 20, and stay on PrEP until age 60. So, you know, there will be periods of time, probably, which is a bit like women do with contraception. 
So no woman stays on the same contraception method for his all, you know, his whole, her whole active sexual life. She might start with condoms or with a depot injection and then goes to the pill and then goes to the IUD and then finally husband gets a vasectomy and there's no problem anymore. Okay, so there will be a mix of different options during the active sexual life of gay men, in my opinion.